welcome to Reading the Room, a literary podcast featuring author interviews and discussions with bookish content creators. I am your host, Jalen, also known as The Bar in the Bookcase on YouTube. Today I am joined by Richard Mirabella, author of the debut novel Brother and Sister Enter the Forest, available now from Catapult. I have been so excited about this episode because I've followed Richard for a long time now on Twitter, received many book recs from him, and he's just such a kind person, and so I've been so hyped for his book to be out in the world and to finally discuss it with him and read it and share it everywhere, and it is now here today. This was a personal favorite discussion of mine. We talk about queerness, horror, family, trauma, literary form, and so much more. If you'd like to support Reading the Room, I now have a Patreon. Joining the Patreon gives you access to a monthly bonus episode of the podcast, which are chats with friends about literary discourse or other bookish topics. March's episode, coming soon, is all about book talk, the good and the bad, and I'll be joined by frequent friend of the pod, CJ, from the channel CJ Reads. Also, you can receive access to my book club. I select a book each month, and you can join me near the end of every month on Zoom to discuss it with other Patreon members. For March, we're reading The Shards by Brett Easton Ellis, and in April, we're reading Burnham Wood by Eleanor Catton. If you miss it or cannot join, the book club recording will be uploaded to my YouTube channel so you never miss out. Reading the Room is an independent podcast, so every member contributes to making this the best literary podcast it can possibly be. Thank you to all who have joined so far, and I look forward to meeting more of you at patreon.com slash reading the room, also linked in the episode notes. Now let's get into the chat with Richard Mirabella. Richard, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to start by asking you about where this book started for you. This book has a lot going on, lots of relationships at its core, and I'm just wondering what the impetus was for you writing this book. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I started it in, in 2015, and I don't really know why, but I wanted to write about a brother and sister. Um, I don't have a sister. I, I have a brother, but I'm just really fascinated by the sibling dynamic, especially between brothers and sisters. And I think I had the idea to write something about siblings. And then I read uh, the fairy tale, the Grimm's fairy tale, Little Brother and Little Sister. I had never even heard of it. You know, there are very famous tales. And then this was one of the ones I'd never heard about before. But there is a really interesting transformation in it. And that sort of helped me figure out where I wanted to go with the project, whatever it was, I, I, I sort of had trouble calling it a novel at first. I kept going back to it and, and it really did help me shape the novel. The novel is not a retelling um, of the fairy tale, but the, fa the fairy tale sort of helped me figure out where I wanted to go with it. I would say that that's really the origin of where this book came from. I was thinking about this book after, you know, finishing it, and I tend to find that I haven't read too many novels that focus on like a brother-sister dynamic. I myself am an only child, and I thought it was a really interesting exploration, particularly in how this book in a way sort of mirrors like a triangle, like a love triangle, but it's, you know, between the mom and then her two kids and how that kind of trio dynamic shifts throughout the course of the narrative. And so I wanted to ask you about Grace, Willa, and Justin. How did Grace factor into this uh, relationship? I think Grace was tricky for me because I wanted her to have some complexity and not just be like the mean mom. You know, I think she's struggling a little bit. And for me, there always has to be a third element, a third person or something, you know, to, to create a little bit more conflict. And also just as somebody with a sibling, I'm fascinated by how people remember their lives, their childhoods, you know, what you think of your parents, what um, it can be so vastly different. Um, so I, Grace to me was a challenge, but also a really exciting element for, for the novel. Um, and I'm also just really interested in mothers. <laughs> um, I have a great relationship with, with mine, but so I thought a lot about her and um, how she could create conflict um, a little bit later in the process of writing the book. You know, in the beginning, it's just a lot of trying things, and, and but in, in later drafts, I thought, you know, well, how what's Willa's relationship really like with her? I think it's very complex. With Justin, there's so much anger and conflict and there's a subtle, I think, or sometimes not so subtle homophobia happening there. And so I think Willa is very conflicted 
um, not just with uh, her mother, but also Justin torn between the two of them. So there are interesting dynamics happening, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think something really interesting that I picked up on was the ways that Willa sort of fills certain gaps in the parenting between Grace and Justin. And mm -hmm. especially like, you know, in the final scene, I don't want to spoil anything, but just thinking about how Willa and Justin's relationship changes based on that. But I mean, aside from that too, Willa's relationship with Justin is very conflicted given his addiction. And I wanted to ask you about how you thought about crafting Justin's addiction, because I appreciated how, I think in certain, some addiction narratives that I've read, there can often be like a bright line introduced or, you know, an absence of like, I guess, relapses. And the book, I think is very realistic in how it depicts Justin's relapses throughout the narrative. Um, so can you just talk about Justin and his addiction and how you crafted that? Sure. I thought a lot about uh, how Justin's trauma would manifest itself and I didn't want it to be too simple. I think trauma is sort of like a, a very diffuse thing. It's like an atmosphere in somebody's life. And I think addiction is part of that. Um, I think self-medicating is part of that. And I really think that's what that's what's happening with Justin. I keep thinking of it in the sense of like in a fairy tale, a curse is kind of broken, you know. Um, it's a spell that, you know, the arc of the fairy tale is then the curse is broken. But in real life, the curse, trauma, whatever, molds itself to a person. Um, it, it shapes their life. And I think there are times where it recedes to the background, times when it comes forward. And I think, so for Justin, it's a lifelong struggle, and so is addiction. I think in general, I wanted this novel to be... I didn't want there to be an easy solution to any of these things. Um, and so when I thought about his addiction, I wanted it to be like, well, there, I think there are times where he'll have sort of triumphed a little bit, where he has more support, um, and then times where something will occur. I don't know, I think after the lake house, there's, there's something happening within him, um, and so he relapses. Uh, not to give anything away, but you speaking on it made me think of how you know the title recalls you know a fairy tale or a very like Hansel and Gretel image in, in the reader's mind, but I think this book is also incredibly realistic, and, and I think the the novel to me in my read is like walking this line between fairy tale and realism, and I think through that this story feels so true, and kind of how I'm asking these questions in terms of how I feel like the relationships and the depiction of addiction is so, and trauma is so realistic, despite like this imagery that you evoke throughout that kind of helps build it out in a really interesting way. And I think one way that you do that is through this really, really interesting structure that I've seen some friends, you know, describe it as kind of like peeling back layers of an onion because it constantly jumps around in time, which I thought was so interesting. And what I want to commend you on is how it doesn't feel confusing whatsoever. Um, and it, it always like really helps push the narrative forward despite jumping backwards or going forward in time. Um, so I wondered like as a writer, how you keep control of those various threads. It seems so difficult, but it really worked well for me as a reader. That's great to hear. That, that was a really <laughs> tremendous worry of mine. I thought actually a lot about um, The English Patient, which is one of my favorite novels. Um, and I feel like Andanchi doesn't give you anything. He just kind of like throws you in and you learn how to read the book by reading it and you kind of figure it out. But I'm not saying that's what I, I did. I really, um, it took a while to get to that structure for me, like a few years. And then I thought about it as sort of taking the novel and like shattering it and then trying to find the pieces that made sense near each other emotionally or narratively. And that's where, that's when the intellect sort of came in rather than like the, the feeling um, that I was going with, um, allowing feeling kind of to, to guide me. So I think, yeah, it just became more about like how, you know, how best to reveal things, um, 
what made sense next to each other emotionally. That leads perfectly to my next question about Willa's hobby of um, creating miniatures. And I feel like when that was introduced in the plot and I started thinking more about how you're structuring the book, these various you know instances in Willa and Justin's life kind of feel like many, I don't know, narratives in themselves and how they all kind of inform each other. And so I'm wondering, did that aspect of Willa's creation of miniatures come later in the process or did you always have that in mind for her? Or like, I guess, was it an intentional symbol that you were kind of leaning into? Yeah, you know, the the book was originally called Dioramas. That was the first title. Um, so I she always made miniatures. And I don't know why. I don't, I don't know where that really came from. I just thought it was interesting. And now it's such a, a huge part of the book. And I, I think it also speaks to what I was going for as far as the aesthetic of the novel and the decisions I made for how to tell the story. Um, I think the renderings in the novel are very minimalist and, you know, it's, that's also sort of influenced by fairy tales, but I liked the idea of the miniatures sort of creating an atmosphere, sort of uh, being a physical manifestation of Willa, I don't know, trying to express herself, trying to work through things. Um, but I also didn't want it to be too heavy handed, you know, just like there's sort of background things. Um, and I like that she uses fairy tale imagery sometimes. I like that there's brutality. So, yeah. It reminded me a little bit of the movie Hereditary in terms of miniatures also being playing a role there and also the fa family dynamics. I thought that was really cool. Um, and I guess that leads to my next question of wanting to ask you just about horror. I mean, I would, I don't know if I would categorize this book as like strict horror, but I, my understanding is that you like horror from what I've seen online. Um, and so I'm wondering how you think about horror in, in your writing life. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I, I don't read a lot of horror anymore. I'm just starting to get back into it because the indie horror scene is just fantastic. Um, there are so many brilliant writers working in horror, publishing themselves. Uh, and so I'm really, I really need to get back to reading a lot more, but it, it influenced me tremendously as a kid. I mean, I, the first books I read were Stephen King and Clive Barker and Poppy Bright and all these people. So I think it's always there a little bit. I'm, I'm interested in the dark side. <laughs> I'm interested in, in that sort of Tr inescapable trouble. I wrote this novel thinking, you know, this is just a quiet literary novel about a family, you know, and I think it is in a lot of ways. There, there are sort of moments of, you know, violence, and I think there's fear inside of it. And my, and my agent thought this is a literary horror novel, and my editor was like, no, it isn't. <laughs> you know, she's like, this is not a horror novel. So I guess people can decide for themselves, you know. I mean, I, I like when fiction kind of leads into that, um, I guess, blending of genres or kind of ambiguity on that front. I think it's, I think it's fun to read because when I was reading this, I wasn't sure where it was going, like in the best way possible. Like it kept me grips because I wanted to see where you were kind of building this out to. And I think the ending is just so, so beautiful. And I mean, one other, I guess, horror leaning element I wanted to ask you about was, this kind of gets into spoiler territory. So if you don't want to talk about it, I get it. But I wanted to ask you about the Lake Man and what that presented in, in the storyline. Because I feel like you can maybe talk about it in a way that's not spoilery because there's some ambiguity there that I think is really interesting. But I guess just from you as a writer, what you wanted to do with that imagery. Yeah, I don't want to spoil it because I think it's a surprising moment. And I personally find it terrifying. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, same here. <laughs> and, thanks. And it was a really, really big surprise for me uh, when I wrote it. I'm really drawn to realistic novels that have an element of surrealism or something that feels kind of left of the dial um, a little bit. And I think that moment is, is one of those moments for me. I don't know who that is. <laughs> and I, I'm okay with that. I know I wrote it, but it's a mystery to me. And I love that. I love mystery. And I think people can kind of do what they want when they read it, um, decide whatever it is. But I know that it's a catalyst for Justin going back to drinking and to 
I think a lot of what happens um, in the second part of the book. Yeah, it, I had to ask you about it. It was so interesting when I came across it and it kind of leaned into that sort of unexpectedness that I think is interesting. And I guess first part here is something that I love hearing writers say upon doing this podcast is when they have things in their novels that they don't, that are sort of ambiguous to them too. I think that's so interesting to me and in how like creating a fictional world can leave its own mysteries even to the person that created them. Like I was talking to Catherine Lacey recently about some things that one of her characters says in her new book, Biography of X, and she says like, I'm not really sure what X meant by that. And that's just such an interesting idea of like putting, having a character speak through you and then not really knowing exactly what that character means. I don't know if you have anything to say about that, but I just think it was interesting hearing you say that. I love that. It's one of my favorite things about writing is discovering something surprising and then never really understanding it. <laughs> of course you can write towards something and then begin to understand and you say, oh wow, I, I learned something I didn't you know, know before from writing, which is so great. And then there are these things that sort of emerge and, and just remain mysterious. And we're all supposed to know how to talk about our novels like perfectly. We're all supposed to know what our intentions were at all times um, when writing our books. And I really don't think we do. Um, I'm figuring it out now, <laughs> you know, like I, I stopped writing this novel in 2018. And it's such a long journey to publication. So now because I have to talk about it, I'm, I'm figuring it out, you know, but mystery to me is hugely important. Um, and it's such a big part of how I write. I didn't know what this novel was about. I didn't know where it was going. Um, even as far as the plot, you know, I didn't outline it. And that's just, that's how I work. I work towards mystery, I guess. That's something that's really fun about this podcast too, is like, I guess when I was initially starting doing like bookstagramming and reviewing books, I found it a little bit unsatisfying because I felt it really hard to distill like in three paragraphs, exactly what I wanted to say about a, 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 like a work of art or something. And so I guess I'm just saying like, I love this podcast to be able to just kind of flesh out these ideas with you like live and just talk mm -hmm. about them. Cause I think that's so ripe for like new creation is like talking about art. And so I don't know what I'm saying with that, but I, yeah, thank you for speaking on that. Cause it's so interesting to me. Yeah. And the main blurb on this book is Joy Williams, who I have not read yet, but I feel like I need to, I know you've uh, commended her work before on Twitter and stuff. I just wanted to quickly ask you for like a recommendation or starting place with her work and how her work informed this novel. So I think you like short fiction as well, right? I do love it. So if I were you, I would just buy her collected, um, the visiting privilege, her collected stories. Every short story Joy Williams has written is a brilliant work of art. Um, so I think you'll really, really love it. And then her novels, it's so hard <laughs> to tell you where to start because they're, they're so different from each other. She's such a fascinating writer, but her debut, um, State of Grace, is really, really an incredible book. It's, it's fascinating what she does with time and I think it's really about a person living in the past, the present, and the future at the same time. Um, and so it flows into the past and back. And it's just so beautifully controlled. Um, and it's deeply disturbing. Um, it's a great book. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've been really dying to read her because I always see many of like my favorite books in relation to or talked about um, in relation to her work. And so I feel like she's an author that I'm just like sitting on a gold mine of, of good stuff. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and I think like the you asked about the influence and it's really hard to say how, except that she makes me want to write about life and reality in a way that makes it, I'm going to go back to mystery again, makes it as mysterious as it sometimes feels. Um, and I think translating that to fiction is very difficult. Um, and she does that very well. She is sort of kind of in a way that Toni Morrison did, allows fiction to be fiction, you know, like anything can happen in it. It's not necessarily magic. It's not, you know, 
It's just that we don't, we're living in this sort of malleable reality. That's what I find so interesting about her. Yeah, that's so, that's something I've been reckoning with a lot, like thinking about fiction is this idea of like how, I don't know, leaning into surreal elements or mystery or things that are a little bit odd, like how in a fictional context, in the form of a novel, it can really be representative of the weird feeling of like living every day and like how the written like word can evoke that. And I feel like your book does that so well in a way that's hard for me to like explain, but I wanted to commend you for it anyways. I feel like you do, you do that, that myster mysterious thing so well. So yeah, I mean, I guess we've been talking around the trauma aspect of this. And, and one thing I've been thinking about regarding this idea of realism in fiction is a lot of the discourse around like trauma plots, when those can go left or when they're done well. And I think in the way that this book is structured really kind of goes against some of the critiques of trauma plots. So I guess all this to say, I wanted to ask you about Justin and Nick's relationship, how you crafted it and what went into thinking about like what to evoke on the page, meaning the violence and the impacts of that on Justin throughout the, the entire book. Yeah, I mean, it's something I worried about the whole trauma plot um, critique a lot. I think, I, at least I hope, <laughs> that my novel is more than a trauma novel. Um, you know, I think it's a relationship novel, and uh, I think it's about toxic masculinity in a lot of ways and familial homophobia. But when I thought about Nick, Nick to me represents my fear of a certain kind of man, <laughs> a certain kind of young man, uh, which I think is a manifestation of my own trauma uh, from my youth. So I think I, I wanted to create uh, a relationship where a character felt sort of safe, you know, like J J Justin goes to Nick after experiencing something pretty horrible you just think, well, of course. So he, he's going to his boyfriend's house, you know, and it's this feeling of safety. But there's something very poisonous inside of this person. And I think that's a, a realistic rendering of a certain type of young man um, who's very body focused, who is afraid his queerness. Um, so it was important to me to, to show that. I didn't want it to just be like, I need someone to do something bad to this character so that this character has trauma he can recover from. You know, that is not interesting to me at all. Um, I'm interested in survival. I, I don't think this novel is about recovery. I think it's about somebody surviving and then how they take that with them, how they carry it and still live the best way they're able to. Yeah, that's, that's beautifully said. And I, I totally got that in my read as well. I mean, I, I think what was really interesting and what really hit home to me too was like, I myself am also a queer man. And I remember like the feelings of being younger and trying to find like a certain kind of solace in relationships with other men, how that can at once feel like something that is safety, but then how that can easily, the fragility of that given, you know, external forces of homophobia and how that all kind of plays out in a weird way. Um, it's an, it was really, I think you did that really well in terms of rendering that, uh, and I related a lot to it. And I mean, because on the one hand too, like Nick is, the violence that occurs also stems from him dealing with homophobia and his own identity too. So it's, it's I guess what I'm saying, it's the really nuanced depiction of this relationship. And, and it made me just think a lot about how you use that as like the impetus for other things in, in the book. And I, yeah, so I guess I'm saying I'm rambling now, but I just think you do that so, so, so well. So oh, yeah, thank, thank you for speaking you. on that Good. and explaining it. <laughs> That's yeah. a relief to hear you say that. Yeah, because uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's still a worry, still a struggle to think about it. You know, I just, that's just how I am. I always am like, well, worrying about how other people will feel, you know, <laughs> like I don't mm. want to hurt anybody. But I just try to be truthful, I guess. I tried as much as I could or what I saw as truthful um, about this relationship, these people you know, and it's difficult to kind of make somebody complex when they don't have their own POV in a novel too. And I think there are, there's a way to do it through dialogue and through, through action. But Nick is an interesting monster. I think there's, I don't know, there's something about him. I feel like I, I've met him before, <laughs> but I, I don't remember. But there are moments like that when I think about being a teen, you know, and being sort of approached by people who 
looked like they could give me what I had been wanting, you know, or dreaming about. I grew up in the 90s, so in high school, I didn't have a boyfriend, you know, I didn't like go to prom with my boyfriend or anything. It was a different time. <laughs> um, so, but I would encounter queer people, you know, in the wild, but usually older. And so when I was writing about Nick, I thought a little bit about moments where I had opportunity, but something about the other person frightened me. And I thought, well, what if I had gone with that person? Like what, what could have come from that? It's interesting too how like, that reflection on youth and those relationships that are formed, how it informs the last relationship that we meet Justin with in his adulthood and how that is sort of, again, not to spoil anything, but how that plays out towards the end of the novel and the kind of thinking about where does Justin go after this book? And again, I think it goes into your point on it being a tale of survival and how this isn't something that you close the book on the fairy tale and it's, you know, clean cut and he's, you know, done with this, you know, I, I think that's really interesting how you use that final relationship to further mine that. So the last question I have for you about, you know, content in this book, and then I'll get into some book recommendations, is the reference to Rosemary's Baby. Mm -hmm. I, all I wrote down is Rosemary's Baby, and I think if I recall correctly, I should have wrote this down, but it's that Willa and Justin watched it like a, a lot growing up. Is that correct? Can you just talk about that that movie? And is that something that you watched a lot, I'm assuming? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just love that movie. and And I thought a lot about like, you know, they should have things that they love, you know, that both of them love and that sort of, you know, bounds them together that they, they enjoy something that they can even talk over, you know, it's just a part of their lives. And I just thought that Rosemary's Baby was <laughs> such a funny choice. But I always think about like Alien was one of my favorite movies um, of all time growing up. And it's something I watched with my mother a lot. So what, why I liked Rosemary's Baby for Justin and Willa is because there's a lot of, um, I don't know, there, there's like a great atmosphere. They, they love Ruth Gordon. They're, they, they can like, one of my favorite little details is how they stop talking when Ruth Gordon comes on the screen. <laughs> they just enjoy her performance so much. So for me, it's just a character thing, something that they would like. And I think it says something about them that that's their favorite movie. Um, it's not something kind of lighthearted. It's this weird sort of very dark, but comedic piece of media. Something that comes up too is I, th I think a lot about how queer people, we, we tend to love horror, it seems like. Um, <laughs> really interesting. I mean, I grew up, like my favorite movie still, a favorite franchise, like Scream, which I think about a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And I just loved reading Stephen King like you growing up and all of like my art, my burgeoning love of art stemmed from horror, which is interesting. I don't read a lot of pure horror now, but I guess it gets to my last question of, of book recommendations and anything you've read recently that you really enjoyed or anything coming out soon that you're excited about kind of open-ended. Yeah. Oh boy. Um, bunch of things. Uh, I just read Open Throat by Henry Hoke, I think. Is how I'm excited about that one. Yeah. I really loved it. Um, it's, I don't know. It's sort of like a fairy tale in some ways. It's it's sort of funny and dreamlike and but also brutal. Uh, really original. My Dead Book by Nate Lippins. Brilliant. One of the best queer novels I've read in years. Have you read it? Or? I just I don't know if it was you that tweeted about. It. I just saw it recently. I think it might have been you. <laughs> I could be wrong though. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. And then um Marissa Crane's book that just came out, um, I keep my exoskeletons to myself, is I think I, I list it as a favorite novel now. It's it's so, so good. So like wonderfully queer and, and sexy. And then speaking of horror, I have to have to have to recommend um Kyle Winkler. He's he writes um weird fiction and horror and literary fiction. And he put these novels uh, out himself and a short story collection uh called O oh Pain, which is brilliant. So definitely look into him too. Yeah, I actually so it's right here somewhere. I bought O oh Pain based on your recommendation yeah. like over a year ago and it's still on my TBR. I have to get to it, but um yeah, I bought that because of you. So <laughs> I'm oh, excited great. to get to it. Yeah. Yeah, he's wonderful. And, and if you read it and love it, 
definitely you should have him on because he's a great speaker too. And thank you for joining me today. This was so much fun. Um, yeah. I loved unpacking this book. It's really one that's like ripe for discussion and I will be thinking about it for a long time to come. So congratulations on the debut. I know it must be a huge feeling to have it finally soon be coming out. So thank you for taking the time and coming on. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was great. Mm -hmm.